Psalms chapter 8. O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, all that swim the parts of the sea. O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for another Sunday, another day on which we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in which we celebrate our membership in the body of Christ. And we thank you, Lord, that you have brought us to this time safely and that we are in the land of the living in the sound of each other's voices. And we pray today, Lord, that as your word goes forth, that your word would go forth with anointing, with power, and that we will have ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to your church today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you. It's a, a another day, another Sunday worship service that we're doing remotely, and we welcome you to our Sunday worship service of the Marston's Mills Community Church. I am Pastor Earl Roberts, and I am the lead pastor, the only pastor of the Marston's Mills Community Church. And I have a word from the Lord for the church today. And I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Psalm chapter 137. The book of Psalms chapter 137. And we are going to be concentrating on the first four verses the first four verses of the book of Psalms, chapter 137. And verse 1, and I'm going to read verse 1 and verse 4 to begin with. And later on, we'll concentrate on verses 2 and 3. So Psalm 137, verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. And verse 4. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? And we're going to try to give some insight into that question today. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? Well, Psalm 137, as you uh, very good Bible students would know, is, 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 is a lament about the great tragedy of the Babylonian captivity, the national deportation of the nation of Israel, well, really the, the southern uh, two tribes, the, the tribe of uh, Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, to the Babylonian Empire. And of, of course, most, most of you would know of uh, those, that, that great song by uh, Boney M or, or the original, which I prefer, by, by the Melodians, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Here we wept and we remembered Zion. And, and, and this is a song, of course, about that great tragedy in the national life of the nation of Israel. And, and it, it evokes great sadness. It's a song of, uh, of unfamiliarity, of hardship. It's a song which speaks of dislocation. It's a haunting psalm. If you know, if you if you have known that 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 psalm since I was a boy, and it's a haunt. It always haunts me the way they lamented the 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 movement away from the familiar, the longing for home, 
a haunting song. It speaks of the loss of home, uh, of the loss of all that is familiar, of, of, of the loss of all which makes us who we are. You know, uh, so we, we are losing that and, and we're, we're singing a song of sadness about losing that. And as such, it's also a sort of prophetic word which speaks to us today as a church. Because now, as it was then, we have suffered the loss of what we have been familiar with, what has made us who we are as church. We, 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 are, in the mid, we are in the midst of transitioning out of the familiar, out of Zion, out of home, and into something that is not quite, we're not quite certain what it is that we're going into. It's unfamiliar. It, 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 in fact, it may even be something hostile. So, so as it was in the Babylonian captivity of the nation of Israel, so it is now that God was then engaged in deliberate and purposeful activity. He had warned the nation of Israel. He had warned the kingdom of Judah. He had warned them. If you do not amend your ways. I will send the Babylonians against you. They will carry you away captive. And they did not heed his warning. Jeremiah in particular. Spent most of his career. His prophetic career. Warning the nation of Israel. About what was about to happen to them. If they did not amend their ways. And, 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 and God was indeed behind the Babylonian captivity, raising up the Babylonians and bringing them against Israel to take Israel away from the land for 70 years. And, and, and then, as it is now, I believe that was a watershed moment in the life of the nation of Israel. For forever thereafter, you people... You, you, the historians will speak of pre-Babylonian captivity and post-Babylonian captivity. So that was indeed a watershed moment in the life of the nation of Israel. They went away captive for 70 years and they were never the same after that. Even after they came back after 70 years. I believe. That in the life of the church, God is doing a new thing. I believe that in the life of the modern church, especially the church on Cape Cod, to which I have been called and to which I'm speaking today, God is, is, is giving us a watershed moment so that will distinguish the pre-corona church forever from the post-corona church. So what is God doing? What is God doing? That, that, that is on the minds of all Christians everywhere. That is on the minds of all men, of, men and women of God who are seeking God and, and praying and, and fasting and meditating and, and seeking God and asking God, what are you doing? We know that you're doing something, Lord, but what is it? What are you doing? Well, I have a couple of insights and I, two insights that I want to give you today. And then the, the third thing I want to give you is a, a, an instruction from the Lord. First, the first insight I want to give you is that God is doing a new thing. It's the most overused phrase in modern Christianity. I know, I know. And, I'm, and so I'm guilty. I'm guilty of it. But, but I believe that if this doesn't define a new thing, that, that, then nothing defines a new thing. If this isn't a new thing that God is doing, then God cannot do anything new. But God is a God of new. God is the, the God of fresh starts. God is a God of new beginnings. God is, a, is an infinitely creative God. And I believe that he is doing something new in the life of of the modern day church. As he says in Isaiah 43. See I am doing a new thing. So I'm not inventing that aspect of God's, uh, of, of God's personality. I'm not inventing that aspect of God's character. He, he repeatedly tells us in the, the, the scripture. Look I'm doing something new. 
Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? So it's not that whether it's not that God, not whether or not God is doing something new. Is the only thing, the only question is, do we perceive that God is doing something new? So we should say goodbye to the old thing and anticipate the newness which the Spirit is bringing to the church. It is just like the Spirit to come in like a mighty rushing wind and just blow everything away that we knew in the past. You see, uh, it, when Daniel saw his, uh, his, his interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream in the second chapter of Daniel, what, what, what Nebuchadnezzar saw was that a mighty wind came and blew away all the remnants of the kingdom of the world. And that's, that's God. As he came in, as the Holy Spirit came in the book of Acts, in, with a mighty rushing, a fresh wind, a new wind, a mighty rushing wind, a new work. And, and, and Peter was able to say, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last day, says the Lord, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And, and so that was something that had not been seen in that dimension before. And I believe similarly that God is doing something so new that it requires that God put a definite partition, set a definite uh, event which, which forever identifies the point in time that God, has, that God started or initiated something new in the church. See, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself so that they may proclaim my praise. So what this new thing that God has initiated, it will appear to us sometimes as though God has just dropped us in to a, a, a desert, into a wilderness, into a, 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 a trackless uh, piece of land in which we cannot find our way. But he has promised to make a way in the wilderness. And so as we negotiate this newness, know that God's spirit is with us and he will guide us. He will tell us to go right or left. He will tell us yea or nay. He will bring to our minds and bring to our remembrance some of the newness, some of the new things that he is telling us that we should be involved in and that we should do in this new era of church. As the prophet Daniel said, praise be to the name of the Lord forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. Why? He changes times and seasons. Daniel 2, 20 and 21. God changes times and seasons and he is in the midst of doing a new thing. What are we to do in this newness that God has brought us in? We are to occupy. We are to occupy the land in which God is bringing us. The strange land, the new land, the unfamiliar. God is bringing us there so that we can live there, prosper there, operate there flourish there. He told the nation of Israel in, in Jeremiah 29, 5, 7, and 11, he told them, build houses in this new land that they are going into, even though it, 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 it's, a, it's a land of captivity. You build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. So you see, it is in the, it is in the context of this newness, this unfamiliarity, this seemingly hostile new environment, which the nation and the church finds itself that God is saying, settle down there, flourish there. This is where I have brought you and I have a plan for you in this new thing to, 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 make, to build your hope 
and a future. I didn't bring you here to harm you. I bring you here. I brought you here so that you may flourish here. Even if it is something new, even if, even, if, even if you have to learn new ways of flourishing, even if you have to follow me where you have not seen me before, I'm there and I'm bringing you to prosper the church. Are you with me? And it is a strange land. It is, it is strange in that we have not been this way before. This new church that emerges and and for some reason i can't stop preaching about the emerging new church uh, we think we have seen new church before but 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 let me tell you church is going to church has changed will change and will continue to change in ways which we have not yet anticipated and have not yet seen with in ways which god has not revealed to us as yet he's only telling us hey this is new you haven't been this way before it's a strange land, and sometimes we may feel as though we are being set upon, as though we're being surrounded. And, and you know, the great Marine, uh, Chesty Puller, when uh, at the Chosen Reservoir in the Korean War, when he was told that his regiment was surrounded, he said something. He said, all right, they're on our right, the enemy is on our left, we have enemy in front of us. And we have enemy to our rear. We are surrounded. They can't get away this time. He turned the whole concept of being surrounded into an opportunity to fire all around his perimeter at the same time. And this is what God is doing. God is a God who turns the captivity into captives. So he's a God who, 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 who led captivity Captive when he when, when, when he rose from the dead, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So what the enemy has has intended for our evil, what the enemy has intended in order to restrict us, to constrain us, to capture us, God is 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 turning into an opportunity. You see, God is reframing the captivity. The children of Israel were captive. The church appears to have been straightened, have been uh, 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 dismissed out of their churches. But what, what God is reframing that into an infiltration. When the enemy thinks that he has us surrounded, we have him infiltrated. You see, the truth is that what the enemy thought was a captivity, God has determined that it is an infiltration. The truth is that there is no strange land for the church. There is no strange land. It is all God's land. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. The people and everything and all who live in it. And the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. So to the church, no land is hostile. To the church, no land. We cannot be constrained and captured anywhere we are. In fact, what God is giving us, even though the enemy thinks it's that they have us boxed in, what they have in fact is the church in the midst of the enemy. And the church will be the church wherever the church finds itself, in whatever situation the church finds itself, in whatever land the church finds itself, if we are church, then we become the victors. We become the infiltrators. We become the aggressors. We become the ones who, 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 who preach the word of God and spread the message of the kingdom of God to our, in the midst of the enemy camp. Amen. The enemy has made a mistake. And in and, and, and Psalm 137, that's Psalm of Lamentation, they didn't comprehend at the time the opportunity that the enemy gave them. But we as church, we understand the, the opportunity we have. We understand the time that we have. The Times says, 
Psalm 137 chapter verses 2 and 3 says, There on the poplars we hung our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs, our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. See, God has brought the instrument of revolution and the instrument of revelation into the midst of the enemy camp. And God has arranged for them to ask us for it. They think they have us captive, but no, we infiltrated them. And then they think that they are mocking the church by saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But the songs of Zion are what brings the power of God to bear. And this is what the Lord is saying to the church today. So two insights. Number one, the first insight is, <laughs> first insight is God is doing a new thing. The second insight is, insight is, that this is no strange land. This is God's territory in God's time for God's people. And the, 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 the one instruction that I have from the Lord is unhang those harps. Unhang those harps. Those harps that you hung in shame and in sadness and in desperation. You said no more. You hung them on the poplars. Take them down and begin to sing the song of the Lord. Through the praise of children and infants, God has established a stronghold against the enemy and to silence the foe and the avenger. God says, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations where I have sent you, where I have caused you to infiltrate. We have placed and positioned you. Sing his glory. Declare his glory. His marvelous deeds among the peoples. Uh, which I have scattered you. Or infiltrated you. Sing the songs of Zion. They who wasted us required of us mirth. They said sing a song. But when the song of the Lord begins to come forth. The presence of the Lord is manifested. And when the presence of the Lord is manifested, the glory of the Lord is seen. And when the glory of the Lord is seen, God reaches out his hand to save and to convert and to, and to shift the, 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 the scenario out of what you, people believe it is into what he would have it to be in, in, in into God sets the conditions for a mighty move of his spirit among the nations and that is what God is doing now so unsling those harps pick them up sing the songs of Zion once more not the songs of the Zion that we left behind but the songs the new song sing a new song unto the Lord the song of, of where we're going not the song of where we've been where we've been was good where we've been has set the stage where we've been has set the foundation but where we're going is so much more glorious it's from glory to glory even by the Spirit of the Lord sing a new song in the midst of of where God has planted us, where God has placed us, where God will deposit us at the end of this coronavirus pause. Sing a new song and see new things break forth in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen.